It's what we say to each other to feel close, snuggling in bed after a hard day of teaching. Or after we get the bad news that a friend's cancer has spread and we need to feel safe. Or when one of us returns from a trip and we want to feel reunited. When we chose gold wedding rings to replace the silver ones bought on St. Mark's Place for 10 bucks in the early days of our infatuation, 17 years before our marriage, it's what we had etched on the inside of them. You are my home. I grew up in a suburb with two working parents in Washington, D.C. Home meant fighting about politics when my liberal eldest sister and her boyfriend came for Sunday pot roast and potatoes. Home meant listening to my parents swap thoughts on the neighbors every evening as they downed their scotches and bourbons while I wolfed my supper ahead of them. Home meant sharing Thanksgiving and other holiday meals with three other families for years. In short, home meant mealtimes. In my 30s, I became a successful singer on the road about two-thirds of the year. Home became a series of apartments in New York and Washington where I could park myself on a sofa between gigs. I'd arrive back, root around for a stack of books, bake a sheet of chocolate chip cookies, and set about reading other people's stories for days on end before boarding the next airplane. I met my husband, James, the same way I met my previous two partners, singing an opera, this one at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I was having a terrible time, and not my first, struggling with a director who hadn't any more regard for me than I had for him, trying to believe in what I was being asked to do on stage. Why did I still put myself through this torture? During rehearsals, I kept to myself, talking to almost nobody besides one long, familiar, and cherished colleague who helped me to keep some perspective. James and I locked eyes over the shrimp canapes at the cast party after our final performance. I had already belted down several reassuring cocktails, but looking into his brown eyes sobered me right up and then intoxicated me all over again. We talked nonstop for a couple of hours before I had to leave. The next day, I was departing for Germany to sing, my suitcase already packed. James accompanied me as far as the Park Place subway station. We didn't kiss. We just looked longingly at each other as my train pulled out. Upon my return, the stack of mail in the foyer included a postcard with James's phone number. If you're ever in Boston, dot, 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 I picked up the phone and dialed. I'm so happy you wrote me. I'll be in Boston tomorrow to hear my friend Lorraine sing. I have an extra ticket. Would you like to accompany me? I didn't have an extra ticket yet, but when he said yes, I called Lorraine and got one. <laughs> it wasn't long before James moved in with me in New York. And shortly thereafter, I spent almost two months away in Germany again. Having an international relationship before text or email meant synchronizing clocks. I'll call before I leave for rehearsal. That's three in the morning your time, okay? <laughs> when I got home, James said, I don't think this is going to work for me. But I responded without a beat. I've had it with living out of a suitcase. You are my home now. I had two more opera contacts to fulfill. I became an educator and sometime director. A series of improbable apartments led to a house in a small town in the Hudson Valley. Two cats and beloved gardens. And I realized the most important thing of my life, he really was my home. <laughs>